Good evening. Can you hear me? Is it loud and clear? Or do I need to use the mic? All good? OK, let me try one more time. Good evening. Still not good enough, right? Let me try one more time. Good evening. That's awesome. OK. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming and spending your valuable evening. Really appreciate it. And uh, I, I feel so great to be part of this meetup group because it's an opportunity for me to learn as well as share at the same time, right? Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Anil, Anil Sagar. Uh, I'm a customer engineer at Google. So today, we're going to learn about secret sauce of microservices and API management. So what is the secret sauce? We're going to find out. But before we find out, let me ask you a few questions. What does microservices mean to you? Why do you need microservices? Anyone? Easy to debug. Easy to debug. No. What else? <laughs> Sorry? To avoid, to avoid monolithic applications. Great. Why does companies need microservices? Easy for deployment. Yeah. Easy, easy for deployment. Scalability. Easy of scalability. Exactly. Save resources, save money, right? More than anything else, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? Save money, right? So, why do you need API management? What is the importance of API management? Sorry? Decouple front and back end, that's great. What else? What is the importance of API management for the companies, for the companies that you work for? Uniformly apply policies across. Uniformly apply policies. What else? Monetization. That's a great point. Monetization, right? Today, a lot of people think APIs as a technology. APIs is a way to connect your mobile application to your backend. APIs is a way to connect your website to backend. APIs is a way to do integration. That's not true. That's not fully true. That's, that's partially true. What does API really mean? APIs are business products. When I go to Wikipedia, I see API is application programming interface, right? right? You might be surprised to hear APIs are business products, right? So let me tell you a story why APIs are business products, why API management is very critical for any enterprise before we go into Kubernetes and technical and all the stuff, right? Because it's all related, right? We'll stitch together the story. How many of you use Google Maps here? Right? Almost everyone. How does Google Maps make money? Exactly. So, so what is the answer? APIs are the business products. Right? Google makes money through APIs. Today, take any company. Uber, Google, Facebook. They all have APIs. They all integrate with other businesses. Right? And indirectly, they create new business revenue channels. So API management is very critical for any company right, that is operating today in the space. So what is the secret sauce of microservices and API management? What is in it for you? right? What is in it for you? Let's find out. Uh, how many of you heard about these two logos? Or, uh, how many have you seen? First one is Istio. That is the secret sauce to microservices. How many of you heard about Apigee, right? So Apigee is an API management from Google, platform from Google. It helps manage APIs, secure APIs, scale APIs, develop APIs, right? Analyze APIs, monetize APIs. But we're going to focus more about Istio and Kubernetes and microservices today. We're going to talk less about Apigee, OK? So the agenda for today, what are the challenges of microservices? Microservices are really cool, right? Everybody talks about microservices today. But there are challenges in building these microservices, right? Deploying them and then scaling them, managing them, and find out, finding out what is going on. So Kubernetes is a platform to manage the containers, right? So let's say you are managing the containers, you are building the microservices. How do you manage these microservices? So that is where the Istio comes into the picture. So we're going to talk about microservices challenges, and we're going to talk about the Istio and the service mesh concept. And 
we are talking, we're going to talk about microservices and APIs, how they come together, right? And we're going to see a cool demo, right? Starting everything from scratch, okay? So what is a microservice? So people talked about it, right? Why do you need microservices? What is a microservice? So how do you define it? Anyone? What is a microservice? Sorry? What is a microservice? Sorry? <laughs> so, oh, okay, that's a good idea. Independent components. Independent components, okay. What else? <coughs> Breaking down a monolith applications into different components, right? So but means, uh, all APIs with uh, similar domains are grouped together. Grouped together, right? So microservice is an architecture style, right? How you develop applications. It's an architecture style. Right? The things that you do will fall into these buckets, for example, breaking down the applications into multiple small applications. Right? So these, these are fine-grained right? uh, uh, and have a single responsibility, what they do, and independent, different teams can develop right, using different languages. Let's say uh, you, are in, you belong to an e-commerce company, let's say, for example, like Lazada. Right? There are different teams, they develop different applications. One team is working on cart, one team is working on product. One team is in cat working on catalog. Different teams have different skill sets. For example, one team knows Java well, the another team wants to develop on Node.js, right? Another team wants to use PHP, right? They want to develop these applications at different periods of time independently and scale them, manage them without depending on other teams, right? So language and platform agnostic. Like I mentioned, one team can use Node.js, other team can use PHP, other team can use Java, right? So it's language independent. So why do you need microservices? Why do you need microservices? Because if you have a traditional deployment model, let's say you have a business logic and a database and monolithic application, if you want to scale, then you need to scale everything together, right? No matter what. Think about an e-commerce application. How many people actually browse products? How many people actually go and do the checkout and buy the product, right? If it is a monolith application, then you have to scale everything, right? No matter whether the users are looking at the products or they're actually coming to the cart and doing the checkout. Think about the microservices. If you actually break down these services into product, a different catalog, a different service, cart, a different service, checkout, a different service, then you can have only two machines for the checkout and maybe 10 machines for the product catalog. So microservices offers a lot of flexibility and also optimize your resources, right? So how does it look like? Let's say you break down this monolith, the large application, right, into different, different components. So it looks like a service mesh. For example, you will have a front-end business logic, you will have a back-end business logic, you have a database layer, right, you will have invoicing a separate service, and these services you are going to run using things like Docker where you actually package these services and then run on Kubernetes, right, which can orchestrate these containers, the, the Docker containers. So for a simple, like two services, it looks like this, where, for example, invoice is running on, let's say, uh, four containers, right? Uh, Front-end business logic is running on four containers, where you are load balancing it. What happens if there are more services? It looks like this, right? Let's say in any enterprise, you will have multiple applications. Each application will have multiple services, right? Think about you have 10 services and you are running in 10 machines. What will happen? It's 10 into 10, it's 100, right? Assume you have 10 applications, it will be 1,000. So it will look like something like this, right? And you see the networking and the service calls going from one microservice to another microservice, right? What happens if something breaks in middle? How do you find out what is going on? How do you going on? How do you find out what is going on? It's very complex, right? So it's easy to create microservices. You can write a software code and you can deploy in a container, you can use Kubernetes and you can start running them. But how do you manage these microservices? So that's the challenge the industry is facing with the microservices. It's not easy. It sounds very cool, microservices let me break down. 
once you break down, once you start running them, you will end up with something like this. Let's say a particular service fails here. How do you know which services will get impacted because of that particular service? How do you trace? How do you monitor? Right? How do you route? So these are all the complexities that you will face. So obviously there are platforms which help you solve the management of these containers. The Kubernetes, that's what people talked about it. So there is a Docker which helps package the applications. There are others as well. But the problems that you face once you deploy is how do you do load balance? How do you do fault tolerance? For example, if a particular service fails, how do you see the impact of that fault across many other services? How do you observe, right? Which service is talking to which service, how the traffic is flowing in this mesh? How do you monitor? How do you log? How do you do circuit breaking? For example, if one service breaks, how do you find out what is going on? Think about the internet, right? Think about the internet. Today you are accessing some server somewhere, right, in, in other continent, right? You are not worried about how the traffic is going through, which routes and which servers, but still you end up getting that page loaded on your website. Think about the same thing for microservices. How can you do the similar thing that internet works in the, in the microservices world, right? So there are open source tools that you can use on top of the Kubernetes when you deploy the applications. To do, for example, if you want to do load balancing, you can use Ribbon. For the service registry, you can use Eureka. For the tracing, you can use Zipkin. And monitoring, you can use Prometheus, right? These are all the various tools that you can use. But integrating all these things in microservices will take a lot of time. Because think about injecting all these components into microservices. How do you inject into that many number of servers? If you start writing this code, load balancing, service registry, circuit breaking, fault tolerance, and monitoring inside your microservice, it is no longer a microservice, <laughs> isn't it? It will become a monolith. Once start injecting all this code into microservice. So how do you do that, right? So that's where the uh, things like Istio will come into the picture, the service mesh. So let me give you a simple example. Let's say somebody gives you 100 threads, different colors, threads that you put into a bag, it will become a thread ball, right? If somebody asks you to find out which end is where, right? And if some end is broken, how do you go and fix it? It's not easy, right? So you need a platform to manage it. So that's where the Istio comes into the picture. So Istio is an open source platform, open source platform developed by Google, IBM, and Lyft. And most of the components came from these three companies, OK? Just like Kubernetes, how it took over the world, Istio is the next big wave that is coming to the market. Istio is the next big wave that is coming to the market. Let's say you have a monolith. Now you have broken down into microservices. You are using Docker to package microservices. You are using Kubernetes to manage those containers and you are running them. But how do you manage these microservices? So that's where is So let me take a brief pause if you have any questions. What I said, the story. Anyone has any questions? Any questions? No? Okay. So Kubernetes is platform to deploy, scale, and execute the containers. And Istio is a platform to manage the microservices, right? So with Istio, you don't need to use these different components and worry about how do I integrate these things into my code, because Istio is going to help. Because Istio comes with a proxy that sits next to your service. It's called Sidecar, Sidecar proxy. It automatically injects these proxies next to each microservice, which handles the load balancing, routing, right? security between the microservices, right? circuit breaking, and all these components. So this particular proxy is called Envoy. It, is, it came from Lyft. It can handle 2 million requests every second. It is battle tested. So that's part of the Istio. So Istio Pilot is the configuration uh, engine where you can actually define all the rules, which can automatically go and deploy these rules in each microservice that is running inside the containers in the Kubernetes environment, okay? 
think about the service to service communication how do you secure it so what is the transport level security that you are aware of when you want to expose the services how do you secure the services when you expose them uh, oauth is more at the api level but the transport level ssl right so what about the security between these microservices right what about the security between the microservices within the service mesh yeah how do you manage the certificates how do you renew them right think about in the service mesh right if you have like 10 microservices running in 10 containers you have 10 applications how do you secure the connection between these microservices how do you manage them right so istio provides out of the box capability right where it can actually create these certs and secure the endpoints and whenever the certificate expires it can also renew it so istio manages that ECO also has a plugin concept right where you can intercept the traffic and execute some policies right so that you don't need to actually put all this code inside your microservice if you put all this code inside your microservice it will become monolith okay so this is how the entire architecture works of ECO for example if you have a microservice that is running inside a container of a kubernetes pod right and if you have another microservice so the pilot can give the rules to this envoy proxies and manage the traffic for example load balancing splitting the traffic and all those things so i have a microservice do i need an api management answer is yes or no <laughs> why i already have apis why do i need api management Sorry. One on three points. One. To have one on three points. Okay. A throttling kind of thing. Throttling kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 What else? You won't always have one, right? You will eventually grow. Yeah, you will eventually grow. Absolutely. So let me again take the example of Google Maps. Can anybody guess how many integrations Google Maps has? Like Uber, like Grab, like like Gojek. Who uses Google Maps? Can anybody guess? Thousands. Thousands. Millions. Millions. Ten million. It's ten million integrations, right? So Google exposes these services, right? So how does these external parties consume these APIs? How do they come and find API documentation? How do they test? How do they ask for access? How do they understand about these services? right discovery right how do they how do you discover right so these things fall into api management space you have apis but how do you manage them how do you scale them how do you analyze them how do you monetize them how do you package them so api management plays a very very critical role in that okay so let me talk about the digital value chain today most of the developers or it teams in the company they focus only the first half, this this far left i have my backend systems right i have an api team they're building apis they're exposing apis right but the real problem is how do you make it consumable to partners to external people how do i package it how do i onboard them how do i share the services with them right how do i share the services with them that's important even within the company within the company you have different lines of business how do they find the services when they're developing different applications how do they ask access right so how do you bridge this gap right starting from back end to api teams building apis the application developers who access these apis build applications and give it to end users today most of the teams are focusing on exposure of apis let me build microservice let me deploy in kubernetes let me expose it right but how do i package these things how do i onboard my part partner how do i share these things that is where the api management comes into the picture so for example api catalog and discover today you go to developer.google.com you find maps api right how about the same thing for your company for your apis right how many of you have developer portal in your company where you can access the apis right three four hands right 
How many of you onboard partners through a developer portal, just like Google Maps, and share the services within five minutes? Right? Two hands. Right? How many of you actually analyze which partner is accessing which API through which app, which is talking to which backend, and how many API calls are coming? Do you have this data on the hand? Right? So again, few hands. Right? So think about the same thing for your internal teams, internal applications, how do you find gain visibility? So that is where API management comes into the picture. So the microservices management platform, the Istio, solves these problems at the microservices level. And the API management solves these problems. For example, it can be onboarding a partner, it can be providing a catalog, right? All these things. So when we talk about microservices creating these APIs, we are only talking about develop and secure. But we need to connect all these dots as well. For example, how do you package these APIs? How do you publish them? How do you scale them? How do you monitor them? How do you analyze them? As well as how do you monetize them, just like Google Maps? So that is where API management plays a very, very critical role. Okay? So these are the different patterns. I won't go deep into that. right? So on a high level, when it comes to technical nature, the Istio addresses these problems. And the API management addresses these problems, right? So let's go into the demo. I know slides are boring, right? Most of the times for the uh, technical developers. Let's look at the demo, how the story comes together, right? The Kubernetes and Istio and API management, okay? So any questions? What do you heard? Uh, if we are speaking from an on-premises perspective, from a public cloud provider side, like before presentation spoke about ingress controllers. So now if I'm thinking of exposing my service to the outside world, like I look at several options right from SEO gateway to Kubernetes ingress controllers and how when we speak about API management, we have API gateways. Right. So when it comes to choosing between these three, mm -hmm. what are all the factors which I should be having on my mind? So, Obviously, if you are building the microservices, you will use Kubernetes or Docker to manage the containers where you are running the microservices. So once your containers are up and running, if you have many containers and many microservices, if you want to manage these microservices, then you will use Istio, right? And then, great, you have used Istio, you are managing the microservices, but you need to expose them to developers. You need to package them. So that is where the API management components will come into the picture. For example, Apigee is one of them. Again, there are a lot of open source as well, like Kong and others that you can use right, uh, in the market. So you need to connect all these dots, just not managing the microservices, just not building and using the Kubernetes. How do you expose them? So there are a variety of options that are available. right? But depending on the needs, you will pick and choose what you need. Right? But these are the best options, because if you talk about managing the containers, right, Kubernetes is the best one. If you talk about managing the microservices, Istio is the best one, right? because again, it's open source. It's all battle tested inside Google, Lyft, and IBM. Right? The components came from these people. They're already using this in production. Right? And then when it comes to API management, again, you have a lot of uh, things that are available in the market. But if you are looking at enterprise version, and Apigee is the leader in the API management space. Right? That's also from Google. Anything specific? I'll approach you. Okay, great. <laughs> so, any other questions before we go on to the demo? Okay. So, uh, we're going to use Google Cloud today to see how everything works together. Uh, one second. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch a Kubernetes cluster in Google Cloud, and we're going to deploy a sample bookstore application. That sample bookstore application has different microservices. For example, product catalog, reviews, and details. Let's say, let's say there are three, micro, three microservices that are running inside this particular cluster. So I'm going to go to Google Cloud and launch a cluster. So 
I'm going to use the Google Cloud Console to do this. Okay. So this particular cluster will have multiple VMs, the virtual machines, right? And you can scale them on demand. And you can run your applications, microservices, inside these machines, which are managed by Kubernetes. Okay. So this is a console of the Google Cloud. So I'm going to just make it a little big. So as you can see here, uh, I'm launching a cluster called Istio cluster, and four uh, nodes and four machines on this particular cl cluster in the Singapore uh, data center. Okay. So I'm just running a command and launching these virtual machines, right? So it's going to take a few seconds. There you go. So if I go to clusters, if you just refresh this, you will start seeing them. Second. Okay. It's going to take a couple of seconds to launch the cluster. So you can do it using UI as well. And if you're a developer, if you're friendly with the command line option, then you can just go to the console and execute a command, which is going to talk to the API, the Kubernetes API, engine API, and going to launch the cluster. There you go. You can see, right? The Istio cluster is uh, getting created, uh, uh, four uh, uh, nodes, and uh, each having four cores and 15 JB memory, right? So once the cluster is created, what we're going to do is we're going to launch a sample application within the cluster and install the Istio, OK? We're going to see everything uh, in a nice visualization at the end of the demo, right? How you can able to trace and monitor your microservices that are running inside uh, this particular cluster. It's going to take around a couple of seconds. Maybe I can answer any questions if you have related to API management or Istio. I can take up some of the questions, yeah, in the meantime. Istio is also doing load balancing. Istio is also doing load balancing. So Istio today has traffic management capabilities like traffic splitting and load balancing and all those things. But if you are looking at particular capabilities like throttling or rate limiting, right, then you have to do at the API management level. Not at this point of time. Okay, but they still also has plugin and adapter concept, right? Uh, there are again some plugins wrote by the developers, right? Uh, but generally, these things you can decouple and do it at the API management level, not at the Istio level. Okay, maybe in future it will come up. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, so there is a difference. I'm sorry. Thank you. There is a difference, as I understand, Google use service mesh and Istio. Istio is an open source product. Service mesh is intended for GT and uh, much commercial products. Is this a functional difference between two of those products? That would be number one question. Okay, I, I haven't heard about a product called service mesh. It's a concept, right? If you have microservices, that are running in multiple clusters of nodes, obviously each microservices will be talking to another microservice, right? That network is called a service mesh, right? So how do you manage this service mesh is where the Istio plays. How do you manage this service mesh? Also, Google is coming up with a managed Istio as part of the Anthos. If you heard about Google Cloud and Anthos, Istio is part of the Anthos on top of the Kubernetes, right? So Anthos is a hybrid cloud API management platform where if you have applications or microservices and you are running on Kubernetes, Istio will be on top of it, which can manage these microservices and help expose them. Okay. okay. Uh, second question is, what's the overhead sidecars in terms of latency, memory, and uh, how much is it? That's a great question. So. Uh, uh, I mentioned that 
Istio Envoy proxy was able to handle 2 million requests in a second. 2 million requests in a second, right? And also the overhead is is a uh, few, I can say milliseconds, right? Not more than that. Not more than that, because it's very very lightweight and it is battle tested uh, for for two million requests per second. But I don't know the exact numbers, right? Maybe I can able to share it with you later. Okay. Does this require human set? Which one? Istio. Istio actually runs on top of the Kubernetes. The, all the Istio components that I talked about, for example, the mixer and uh, the pilot and Citadel and all those things is actually the services that are running inside the Kubernetes. So you will see that when I actually install the Istio, if I go and execute, for example, kubectl get pods, you can see all these Istio services running inside the Kubernetes. Any other questions? So we have the cluster ready, right? So, so we created the cluster. So let me get the credentials so that I can interact with the cluster. Okay. So we got the credentials. So let me just bind it. So we have the uh, Kubernetes cluster ready. Right, so GKE is a managed service from Google, which can actually create this Kubernetes cluster and have everything ready for you, so that you can start running applications inside the Kubernetes cluster. So it's almost done. Yeah, there you go. So now we're going to install Istio. I'm going to download it using simple curl. Right. So we're just downloading the Istio 1.1.7 version. Does the product know the option to install Istio Fit Employed in the GKE? So currently it's not available, right? So we're still open using the open source. But as part of the Anthos, it is going to come as prepackaged solution, right? Okay, there you go. So let me install the Istio. So as you can see, right? Uh, so you see Istio is actually having uh, uh, multiple Kubernetes configuration files. Well, what we are doing is just we are looping in and 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 running the kubectl apply command which actually installs all these things and run istio inside the kubernetes cluster Oops. okay i think i forgot to run the cd command yeah there you go So if you go and look at uh, the different services, should be getting started. Maybe time for questions. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, now we're going to install our sample application, which is the bookstore application. So it's going to take a couple of, uh, again, seconds uh, to have this pods created and uh, the application comes online. As you can see, right, uh, so, so initially there was a talk about uh, the pods. You can see the pods where actually uh, the containers will be running, right, inside these pods. And you can see uh, different uh, uh, services. Uh, for example, we talked about Istio Pilot, right? That is actually running inside the Kubernetes cluster, 
right? For example, things like uh, uh, tracing and uh, things like uh, uh, ingress gateway, which is a load balancer for the Istio. So all these are services that are running inside the Kubernetes cluster itself. Okay. So it's going to take a few seconds uh, for all the things come online. In the meantime, we're going to execute some commands. As you can see, these are the different services that are running inside the uh, 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 cluster. And let's look at the pods. Yeah, so uh, you can see that pods are getting started, which are running these applications inside the pods. Okay. So we're going to apply some namespaces. These are the services. As you can see, uh, this particular bookstore applications has a product page, ratings page, reviews page, right, and the details page. So these are the four different uh, uh, microservices as part of the bookstore application. Okay. So we're gonna see the parts where they will be running. Okay, it's gonna take some time to uh, get the parts initialized. Uh, so I'll take some questions if you have any. Any questions? Yes. So how do you install some of the services? Okay. So how internally it manages and which node is deploying some service? Yeah. Means you, are you have four nodes. Yep. So where that this service location, this service location, it internally manages where to put these services or any such logic or something or it will just keep all the things in one node something like that. So Kubernetes manages this, right? Okay. And you will define this particular microservices, how many replicas you want to create and which node and, 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 uh, uh, and where, which cluster you want to run. So you will define that as part of the AML file, the configuration file. So Kubernetes almost automatically picks up these configuration files, right? When you say, yeah. It goes down. Yes. So obviously there will be multiple nodes, right? We, we have seen there are four nodes. Right, and each node will have multiple pods. Each node will have multiple pods where your services are running and replicated. Even if one node completely goes down, you have another node. Istio is also running inside these particular nodes. Which one? Okay. So that is managed automatically by the Kubernetes. Okay, you don't need to manually manage that. Think about if you have many applications, you have many uh, nodes, you don't want to manage that manually. So Kubernetes replication controller and scheduler will take care of taking these applications and then deploying inside these particular nodes. Even if one node goes down, based on the replication factor, it automatically finds out other nodes which have space and launches these pods and, and deploys the uh, containers inside those pods. So Kubernetes autom uh, automatically takes care of it, okay? So any other questions? So we're just waiting for the nodes, pods got to come up. Okay, as you can see, right, uh, this particular uh, microservice is running on uh, uh, two, two, uh, two parts, right? Uh, this particular microservice is again running on two parts. Even if one goes down, you have the same service running in another part, okay? So we're just waiting for the reviews to come online. And also you can see, right, there are different versions. For example, reviews, uh, there, are, there are a couple of versions, three versions. And the ratings, there is a V1, and details, there is a V1, right? So there are different versions of microservices we are running inside this particular cluster. Yes. The, the code you said is it's not like the two container, like the main container and the Istio container, like the main container. Yeah, it's it's two, two, two. yeah, even Istio services are running inside the containers. We will see all of them, right? Okay. Okay. So all the parts are online. 
So uh, we're going to test our application, right? And so we're going to do it directly uh, by by running uh, uh, and accessing uh, the application inside the container. So one second, let me bring up the shell console separately. So as you can see, right? Uh, so here are the different workloads, right? So as you can see, uh, your your application, ratings and reviews, and also you can see the Istio services within the same cluster. Even the Istio services are running inside the Kubernetes cluster, right? Okay. So as you can see, what I'm doing now is I'm directly executing uh, the the command. To get the product page, just to get the title of it. Right now, it is not exposed to the internet. It is within the container. It is not exposed to the internet. So when I run this particular command, you should see, yeah, there you go, a sample bookstore, the HTML title. But we're gonna expose this particular application to the internet and access it from the UI. Okay. So we're gonna do that now. Let's do that. Again. Something is wrong with my machine. Okay, let me try one more time. Let's give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so we're going to expose this application to the internet and we're going to do some routings and rules. For example, 50% of my traffic I want to send to V1, 50% of my traffic I want to send to V2. You're going to see all those things. So let's do that. Okay, so let's get the ports and the IP addresses and then let's expose to the internet. Okay, so we're gonna get the ingress port of the Istio cluster. Okay, so let's get the gateway URL. Okay, echo. Uh, so let's see our application and access it from the internet. How does it look like? Okay, sorry. Okay, so this is IP address, and let's access that slash uh, product page. So as you can see, uh, this is my bookstore application. So I have different microservices coming together as one single application. So I have the uh, book details, I have the uh, uh, reviews and ratings, right? So these are the three different microservices that are running. You might have seen uh, when we launched uh, this particular applications. So you have different versions of microservices running. So for example, uh, there is a product page V1 and the details page V1. 
but the ratings and reviews uh, we have for example uh, we have multiple versions v1 v2 v3 right so if you see here the applications in the current form if i keep refreshing the page you will see the reviews getting changed right so one uh, uh, v1 uh, has uh, for example the ratings and the v2 uh, has the ratings filled in and v3 doesn't have any ratings right so as you can see now i'm splitting the traffic right only for the ratings i'm splitting the traffic only for the ratings where you see the ratings getting changed right let's apply some rules using istio and let's see how that affects the application okay so before we do that let's actually see the visualization how this particular cluster is running okay so let me uh, go back to my application so let me apply some rules and and let's see that particular uh, destination rule how does it look like today so as you can see here this particular aml file uh, we are routing to various various uh, reviews for example we are routing to v1 v2 v3 right so we're going to change this little bit and see how it affects the application so before we do that let's apply some plugins and see the visualization how the cluster will look like so i'm going to install this plugins to monitor trace and uh, visualize the entire cluster and understand uh, the the topology of the microservices that are running so first one i'm going to do is the kiali console which gives the visualization of all these microservices which is very interesting to see so let me do that so let me copy this uh, configuration oops so let me go to the kubernetes cluster so let me apply these rules great and we're going to set the namespace and set the username and password for this particular console let's say admin and admin so let's access this particular visualization tool so this is the url okay so i'm going to log in into this console and let's see how it looks like so this particular uh, kiali console automatically gets injected uh, into the istio sidecar proxy it also intercepts all the traffic and gives the visualization how does the to deployment topology will look like so let's look at our uh, uh, bookstore applications right as you can see so you have a product page microservice you have a v1 version and you have it is talking to the details uh, microservice which has a v1 version and in the same product page you will also access the reviews which has three versions right uh, v1 v2 v3 and then it is talking to the ratings where you see that rating widget right so let's uh, change some rules and uh, see how does it look like so uh, let me uh, make few calls and see the visualization how the traffic is flowing okay uh, colon 80 slash uh, product page okay so let me access a few uh, 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 pages and let's see how does it affect sorry yeah there you go see now you can see how the traffic is flowing right so it is it is going to uh, the v2 and v3 version right uh, coming from the product page uh, to the v1 and it is accessing details and it is going to v1 v2 v3 and then v1 the ratings widget so that's why right if i if you, if i refresh this multiple times so one call is going to v1 one call is going to v2 one call is going to v3 that you can see in the uh, kiali console dashboard you can visualize how the traffic is flowing through different microservices this is very helpful for you right because when you deploy these microservices when you think about large applications it can have multiple microservices and you want to understand how the traffic is flowing right so what happened here is this particular kiali console related code is injected into the sidecar proxy of each and every microservice and it is intercepting the traffic and sending the data to this visualization tool right so let's apply some rules and change the traffic behaviors for example you have a v1 version you are launching a v2 version you don't want to send all the traffic to v2 version 
right? You don't know whether it will work or not, right? Probably you will send only 10 percent of the traffic to V2, 90 percent traffic goes to V1, right? And you want to test. And you also understand how this traffic is flowing through different kinds of microservices. So let us do that. Uh, so let us apply some rules uh, using uh, Kubernetes, which talks to the uh, the microservices running inside Istio. So right now, uh, what I am going to do is, I am going to route all the traffic to V1 only, okay? So I am going to run this rule. So I am going to go back to my deployment. So I am going to uh, run this particular uh, rule. Let me reconnect. It got disconnected. So you can you can look at the rule. So let me show you the rule. Uh, let me do cat on this. Oops. Let's say CAT on this. Oh, CAT space yes. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, I'm going to route to the ratings only V1. Earlier we were routing to V1, V2, V3. Now we are going to route only to V1. So I am going to apply this rule using kubectl command. So kubectl apply, right? So what happens is the Istio pilot takes this rule, automatically propagates these rules to the, the envoy, right, which is sitting next to the microservice, which intercepts all the traffic and applies these rules. Think about if you want to do it manually. You do not know where the service is running on, which, how many number of machines, how do you replicate, how do you go change it, how do you deploy them, right, without affecting the runtime traffic, okay. So great, uh, our rules are uh, deployed now. So if I go and refresh, so you will see only uh, V1, where there is no ratings widget. So even if I keep refreshing it. You can also start seeing the same thing in the Kiali console. So let us say, uh, if I just refresh this. You can see the traffic only going to the V1. Yeah, there you go, right? So now you see the green dots, it is only going to V1. Earlier it was V1, V2, V3. Now you can start understanding and visualize the entire service mesh, right? So think about without these tools and plugins, if you are deploying microservices, how do you actually get visibility, what is going on, right? When you are doing the changes to your microservices. So that is one simple rule and uh, let us look at a few different rules as well. So I am going to go back. So now I want to route based on user identity. For example, I have this particular rule. Uh, let us say, let me copy and see this rule. Catch. Okay, let me do it one more time. Let us say if a particular user logs in, then you want to give V2, right? Otherwise, you want to just give V1. So you can apply all these rules and then deploy using the STO, which can propagate all these rules and, 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 and which can help you do the testing and before you do actually the releases, right? So just in, in interest of the time, right, I can just skip these things. Again, you can do, for example, routing based on user identity injecting an HTTP delay fault. For example, you want to inject a delay into a particular microservice, you want to see how other microservices will get affected. So you can do all these things in Istio, right, without actually going and coding these in individual microservices, okay? So, so that is all I have today in terms of demo, right? Uh, again, we have not covered the API management and how does the API analytics and monetization, everything works, right? If you are interested on that, you can reach out to me. I am happy to share all those things. So any questions? What are you seeing? Yes. So there is a Jipkin. There is a plugin, right? So once you just enable that plugin, you can also trace, right, what is happening. You can see the logs and metrics. Sorry? It's the same UI? Uh, no, it is a different UI. I mean, different plugin that you can use, right? So you can use, for example, Grafana and Prometheus for monitoring and alerts that can automatically go inject into each sidecar proxy. So that you do not need to manually go and code within the microservice. And it means that the sidecar proxy is getting bigger and bigger, right? Uh, that is true. 
but these are all very very small rules that you are defining it these are rules right it's not like an application code you're not actually writing the code again these are all configuration driven approach you're not actually creating a code you're not actually writing code if you start writing code then you will have complications in scaling them and managing them and latencies and all those things you are using istio platform to define these rules which automatically propagates and like i said this platform is battle tested inside the google and left right so we use, we have developed this so that it can address all these complications instead of you writing the code because everything is here is configuration different approach you are not actually writing code so you don't need to worry about the performance and scaling because the platform takes care of it okay is there any documentation around securing istio yeah again like i said istio is open source if you go to istio.io you can find all the details right including these installation steps and all those things Any other questions? Yeah. So circuit breaking um, is a feature. We take the rest of it offline. Um, sorry, no. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks again to the speakers, Daniel, Anil, and Anto, who stepped in for me. Um, Google have very kindly offered uh, T-shirts for everyone. Um, so everyone here should be able to get a T-shirt. Um, they're at the table. We ask you just to be mindful and take just one at this point in time. But basically, thanks for coming. Um, grab some swag. Uh, we don't want any stickers off tonight, so please, if you can take them. But T-shirts, please. Um, thank you.